Issues that really matter, with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello, good evening. It's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. Rishi Sunak has told the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu he is appalled by the IDF strikes in Gaza that killed seven aid workers, including three British citizens. But Israel's carelessness does not help the fact that the West is on the precipice of war with Iran and the Sino-Russian axis of evil. Meanwhile, yet another poll has revealed that the Tory party isn't doing terribly well, facing electoral wipeout, according to YouGov, with the Labour Party taking more than 400 seats and as many as 11 current cabinet ministers. Can the Prime Minister turn this round? Half of HMRC's desks continue to be empty with staff working from home, despite record complaints and waiting times, as the former head of Ofsted has said it's increasingly difficult to have the hard conversations in the workplace that are needed. That's what HMRC must have. Plus, it's been a difficult day for the Royal Mail as it has announced a reduced service for second-class post. This comes amidst GB News' revelations about counterfeit stamps. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by an abalient panel this evening, former Home Office Special Advisor Claire Purcell and the political commentator Kai Wilshaw. As always, as you know, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at GB News. But now it's time for the news of the day with Sophia Wensler. Jacob, thank you. I'm Sophia Wensler. Your top story this hour. A new poll suggests Labour could sweep to victory with more than 400 seats at the next election, leaving the Tories with just 155. YouGov is predicting a landslide for Sakir Starmer, with the Conservatives projected to win even less seats than a previous poll conducted in January. And the Reform UK party has removed two parliamentary candidates for making statements that they say fell beneath their standards. Jonathan Kay and Mick Greeno will no longer contest seats after campaign group Hope Not Hate accused them of sharing racist views on social media. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy says the government should suspend arms sales to Israel if it's clear that international law has been breached. It's after British aid workers John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby were killed when their convoy was hit by an Israeli airstrike while they were delivering vital food aid. They were part of a group of seven aid workers from the World Central Kitchen Organization. Mr Lamy says Britain cannot supply arms to Israel if it's proven to have broken international law. I have now been calling for 12 days for David Cameron to publish the legal advice so that we are clear on whether Israel has contravened international humanitarian law and therefore arms sales should be suspended. And Royal Mail is pushing the postal regulator to speed up reforms, including cutting back on second-class deliveries to just three days a week. The Postal Service says urgent changes are needed to cut costs following a major drop in demand, falling from 20 billion letters to just 7 billion each year. But the plan, which would save around £300 million, would also lead to a possible 1,000 redundancies. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Jacob. St Thomas Aquinas set out three conditions for just war. First, the authority of the ruler within whose competence it lies to declare war. Second, there is required a just cause, that is, that those who are attacked for some offence merit such treatment. Third, there is required a right intention on the part of the belligerents, either achieving some good object or of avoiding some evil. Israel clearly meets the requirements for a just war in what it is doing in Gaza. It is a legitimate authority, its cause is unquestionably just, and there is a right intention. Yet, Israel is losing the propaganda battle and support is declining. 
How can this be? Israel is rightly not held to the lower standards of others of the dictators such as Bashir al-Assad of Syria, who is estimated to have murdered over 600,000 of his own people, nor the Iranians who, with their allies in Yemen, have been responsible for 377,000 being killed, nor even the Chinese Communist Party, which holds, according to Human Rights Watch, nearly a million and a half Uyghur Muslims in detention. The atrocities of the dictators are not the standard by which the people of Israel or of the West expect to be held. The outrageous treatment of people in Syria, Yemen or communist China is different. Western democracies are expected to do better and are rightly held to a higher standard. This is not unreasonable. Nonetheless, Israel needs to win. And we should never forget that in the West. Hamas is supported by Iran. It is part of a global threat to the West. The world is getting increasingly dangerous, and it is visible elsewhere. We see this with what Iran is doing through its Houthi proxies in the Red Sea. We see it through the actions of Russia in Ukraine and the tension that comes from China, not just over Taiwan, but in a border dispute with India that has been in the news even the last few days. And this affects us. Just recently, we've seen a man attacked on the streets of London, apparently by proxies of the Iranian government. We know that the Russians are willing to kill people outside their own territory. These threats are not that remote. And to defend ourselves, we need to support our allies. In some ways, our own proxies are operating in Ukraine, in Gaza and in Taiwan. But Israel is not at the moment making this easy for us, as yesterday's deaths show. The strikes this week that killed three British citizens are very difficult to explain. Analysis from The Telegraph has shown that the IDF uses two types of drone strike, one with a blast radius of 5 to 10 yards and another that is extremely precise, down to a few feet. The drone operator told The Telegraph they could theoretically take out the driver of a vehicle, leaving the person in the back seat alive. The operator also said that strikes are only ever executed upon approval from a lawyer and a senior officer. So we need to understand what went wrong. Israeli media have suggested that the strikes that killed the British citizens were of this highly precise type. We need to take this into account along with the fact that the aid convoy had alerted the IDF of its passage prior to the strike and it was duly approved. There was negligence in what happened and we need to know who was responsible? When will there be a court-martial? The point is that Israel is an ally in the broader global war against Iran as well as Russia and China. A cold war, mostly, but with some hotspots. These actions not only work against the Western cause by granting our enemies moral ammunition, but they work against Israel's interest too. Israel takes pride not only in being a Western liberal democracy, but in having a defence force of the highest moral and strategic standards. Israel, having been attacked and having a just basis for its response, is losing the propaganda war. It needs to win it, and it needs to act in a way that allows its friends to support it with conviction. It needs to answer some key questions. For example, how many people does it think have died as a consequence of its military activity? And how many of those were Hamas fighters? If Israel continues to lose in the court of public opinion, it will lose in the theatre of war. And that would be potentially catastrophic for the Western world, facing threats that we have not faced for many decades. Our friends need to win our support. And they will not do this if the lives of our fellow citizens are lost. As ever, let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. But I'm joined now by UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, Professor Ben Saul. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, do we know what went wrong? Has Israel given a clear explanation of the series of errors that led to the recent deaths? Uh, thanks for having me. And firstly, my sympathy to your country for the loss of three British nationals. And in my country, one Australian was also killed. Uh, Israel has accepted responsibility and apologised, but it has not yet given 
a full account of what went wrong. Uh, it's not enough to say that this is a mistake or that misidentification happened. Uh, Israel has to uh, bring full accountability uh, and to demonstrate uh, whether this was in accordance with international humanitarian law, which are the rules which govern any country fighting uh, in an armed conflict. And Israel clearly has the right to self-defence and it's exercised that. Um, but it does seem as if Israel is losing the propaganda war at the moment. I noticed that the Australian Prime Minister was particularly critical in his comments overnight in response to the death of an Australian that you mentioned. That's right. And I think uh, the fact that so many foreigners were killed in this strike has brought new attention to Israel's targeting practices. But this isn't just a problem affecting foreigners. I mean, this is a problem which has marked the whole military campaign over the last six months. Uh, many uh, uh, alleged incidents of violations of international law by Israel, uh, documented by actors on the ground, United Nations bodies, uh, NGOs, journalists. Uh, so this is a widespread problem. And, uh, and I think uh, in this incident, we need to know uh, whether Israel did everything uh, feasible to verify that the target, uh, according to its information, was military and not civilian, not a, a humanitarian uh, convoy. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, these were uh, known aid routes. These were marked vehicles. There were deconfliction arrangements in place between the NGO uh, and the uh, Israeli government. So it does seem to suggest a, a very high degree of recklessness in targeting uh, and a lack of stand, a, a lack of uh, sufficient care in the protection of civilians, and I think that's been a hallmark of this whole war. But there is a huge difficulty for Israel. It's fighting Hamas, who is part of the civilian population, who hides behind the civilian population, and therefore to root out the terrorist enemy it is going to find itself in these difficult situations. And that's just a reality of how Hamas has behaved. And it can't be excluded from the responsibility for the deaths of civilians because it uses them as human shields. That's right. And urban warfare against insurgencies are always extremely difficult wars to fight. Uh, Israel's not unique in this situation. I mean, these kinds of insurgencies happen uh, in all parts of the world and have been happening for many, many decades. International humanitarian law uh, has been uh, created by states uh, to deal precisely with those difficulties, uh, as well as all other kinds of, uh, of warfare. So, of course, Hamas has a duty itself uh, not to uh, misuse the civilian population uh, in order to conceal uh, its, uh, its fighters, its positions, its, its weapons, and, uh, and so on. Uh, of course, it's not been respecting uh, those rules, but that does not absolve Israel of its obligations to still exercise the required level of care in distinguishing between civilians uh, and military targets in its operations, because otherwise it's just a, a recipe for total warfare on a civilian population. And I think we've seen uh, elements of this with Israel uh, not allowing sufficient humanitarian relief into Gaza, uh, uh, as the, the International Court of Justice has required it to do, uh, as the Security Council in demanding a ceasefire uh, has recently uh, uh, insisted upon. Uh, and so over 1.1 million Gazans now but face... But isn't that, uh, isn't that difficult? Level. Because... Um, we know, certainly the Israelis tell us, that some of the aid is taken first by the fighters. We know that Hamas hid under a hospital, in tunnels under a hospital, and that if you are fighting an opponent who pays no attention to international law and you're then expected to uphold it to the nth degree, then don't you inevitably lose? And that Hamas winning must be bad um, for the international order. Certainly, there is always a risk that uh, aid and food relief and medicine uh, might be diverted to uh, the, the other side in, in an armed conflict. Um, uh, I mean, that's a risk we, we always have to take because we can't allow civilians to be starved to death. Uh, and that's what's already happening in Gaza. I mean, over 30 children have already died from malnutrition uh, because Israel uh, has not allowed sufficient aid 
uh, into the territory. The International Court of Justice just last week called on Israel to open more land border crossings. You can't drop enough aid by air or bring it by sea because that's just not effective and efficient uh, in delivering humanitarian relief on the on the scale uh, necessary. So look, we we are not like Hamas. Uh, I mean, Israel, uh, Britain, Australia, I mean, our countries should respect international law because we do care about human dignity, human values, uh, human rights. Uh, and as a result, we, we must take sufficient care in protecting civilians, even when fighting an insurgent group. Thank you very much, Professor Fasol. I think that's a fundamental point, which I want to put now to Colonel Richard Kemp, who is joining me. Richard, welcome back onto the program. Isn't that last point, and I don't know if you heard it, absolutely fundamental, that Israel, as a democracy, is held to a higher standard, and therefore it has to be pedantic in following the laws of war, even if its opponent is a, an insurgent who ignores them? You're absolutely right, and I think Israel has a long-standing tradition of adhering very closely to the laws of armed conflict. Uh, I've been in Israel many times. I've been into Israel during this war. I've been in Gaza on the ground. I've watched the way that the IDF operate. I've seen the actions they take to minimize the deaths of innocent civilians. I think there's no other army in the world that is so sophisticated in its efforts to minimize the death of civilians. But of course, that is not possible. It's not possible to achieve zero civilian casualties or even a small number when the enemy you're fighting is hiding among the civilian population, is fighting from the civilian population, and his, his tactics are deliberately set out to try and force Israel to kill as many civilians as possible for exactly the reason you described earlier on, which is to make Israel lose the propaganda war, which is happening. It's been happening for, for every conflict that Israel, Israel has ever fought. So, yes, you're right that it is necessary to adhere to the laws of war. I believe that Israel does adhere to the laws of war. Uh, and I, I do think this particular incident we're talking about is an aberration. Uh, we obviously don't know exactly what happened. There are very many occasions in conflict when innocent civilians unfortunately die through accident, if that's what happened here. It may, may, may have been um, incorrect in, in, in intelligence. It may have been a technical failure. It may have been a, uh, a failure to pass the information from one element of the IDF to another. We, we just don't know. But the reality well, is this does happen. All you have to do is think back to 2021 when the US launched a drone strike against what they thought was a terrorist group attacking US forces as they withdrew from Afghanistan. And they ended up killing nine, or well, 10 in fact, civilians, an aid worker and his nine family members, including seven children, due to a misidentification of a vehicle of the type we're, we're, we may be seeing here. And the problem, though, is that it seems to me that it's fundamental for the security of the West that Israel wins and that Ukraine wins, that there are these major strategic threats that are bigger than the West has faced in decades. And yet, if Israel loses the propaganda war, then it ends up losing the war, and this weakens the whole of the... West. So what can Israel do or what should we be encouraging Israel to do as friends and allies to do better in getting its message across, explaining what has happened? Um, simple things. Um, we get this figure of 30,000 have been killed. Is that true? That comes from Hamas. What is Israel's figure? What is its figure for the number uh, of Hamas terrorists who have been uh, killed or captured? I, I, I feel that they're not pushing their propaganda, their answer to their opponents as hard as they should? I think you're right in some ways. It's very difficult for them to do so. My understanding is the IDF do not have an estimate of the total number of people killed in the conflict. Uh, they estimate, I believe, that around 15,000 Hamas terrorists have been killed in this war, which is, if you take the Hamas figures as being roughly accurate, that's approximately half, so one to one, which, which is terrible to say this and reduce human life to, to mere figures, but that is a significantly better civilian to military death rate than, for example, the British and the Americans achieved in Afghanistan, which is about three to five to one civilians. So I don't know if these figures are accurate, but it's, it's a rough guide. 
Well, in, in terms of the propaganda war, the, 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 there is a, a very well-established um, narrative against Israel, which started off in the 1960s in the Soviet Union as a deliberate war, a, a deliberate weapon against Israel. It, it classified Israel as an apartheid state. It classified Israel as occupiers, colonialists. And that narrative has built ever since then. Whatever What happened to Israel on the 7th of October, Israel had it coming. Whatever Israel does in retaliation, it's wrong. That, that's, that narrative is extremely difficult to counter. Now, my view is that one way that it could be countered, and I don't see any likelihood of this happening, is that the British government and other governments could actually try and push the truth rather than supporting the narrative, which they too often do. When, when we had to... to provide huge efforts to support Ukraine. There was a massive British government information campaign to show the British people why we had to support Ukraine. There needs and to it be does seem... I, I, I'm here. sorry to interrupt, but I, I think there's such an important point. It does seem as if support from the US and the UK uh, is weakening, as the vote in the United Nations showed recently and as the response um, to the recent deaths has shown. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and I think that that's due to a large extent, to, to domestic political considerations. The US has a presidential election coming up. They have to appease the anti-Israel lobby as well as support Israel. So they've got to uh, appear to be outraged, whether they are outraged or not, by certain things. And the same applies here in the UK, where, as you know better than I do, we've got a general election coming up <laughs> as well. So I, I, I think that, you know, that, that explains partly why we're seeing outrage. But it is a dangerous thing. I, of course, the incidents like this uh, World Central Kitchen uh, uh, incident are, are terrible, and they do need to be examined and scrutinised and criticised. But if you, if you deliberately set out to criticise Israel unjustly, as happens too often, in order for, for your own domestic political consideration... One of the effects of that is to fuel the anti-Israel campaign and, and in here in the UK, as we've seen, to help incite the Jew hate that we've seen on the streets every week in London and other cities. All right. Well, Colonel Camp, thank you very much for joining me again. Uh, coming up, yet another poll is predicting electoral wipeout for the Tories with the Labour Party expected to win more than 400 seats. But can our illustrious Prime Minister turn it round? And don't forget, we'll be d diving into the GB News story that has rocked Royal Mail on counterfeit stamps. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat because she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat because I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better as 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently told a podcast, diabetes have gone through the roof. You should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, if you'll forgive the <laughs> forgive the phraseology there, and actually, sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded him in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse, uh, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active. 
every hour. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, we've been discussing Gaza and the mail mogs have been zooming in. John says the Israelis are not terrorists. This was a terrible accident. People should know that most cutting edge Western technology is developed in Israel. Without them, we would be at the mercy of our adversaries. Bob says, Bob, I like your message because it says, Jacob, you're spot on. We like more of these actually as mail mogs. We must support Israel. It was sad, but predictable. All wars have unfortunate and regrettable collateral damage. And John, I think most people in the UK indeed throughout the world, consider that Israel's actions in Gaza are disproportionate. Bombing civilian targets is not acceptable, and this is why Israel is losing the propaganda war. And, John, that's certainly where my mailbag is from people writing to me from North East Somerset. This afternoon, YouGov issued another opinion poll, this time detailed seat by seat, and it has suggested that the Conservatives are on track to suffer an even worse defeat than that of Sir John Major to Tony Blair in 1997. Poll has suggested that Labour could win more than 400 seats, achieving a majority of 154, with as many as 11 current cabinet ministers, I'm sorry to say one or two former ministers, losing their seats, including the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, and the Leader of the House, Penny Mordaunt, and your obedient servant. Is there anything that could be done to turn this round? Is it too late to cut taxes, roll back green policies and reform regulations to unleash Britain's animal spirits? Well, I'm joined now by GB News's Deputy Political Editor, Tom Harwood, and my panel, former Home Office Special Advisor Claire Pearsall and the political commentator Kai Wilshaw. Tom, um, we all spend our lives talking about opinion polls. Uh, it's one of the great interests of both politicians and journalists covering politics. Is this one particularly important at the moment? Yeah, there are three letters that you said before the word poll in your introduction, MRP. Now, that's a very technical, cephalogical phrase, which stands for uh, multi-level regression and post-stratification. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that they've just taken a sample of opinion and sort of spread it out and think, oh, that will probably give these sorts of seats. That means they've taken not just those people in their panel, but the attributes, their past voting behaviour, whether they're male, female, young, old, and applied it specifically to every attribute on balance in each seat. And therefore, you can get a very accurate picture of how that poll would actually translate onto the country as a whole. Now, this happened in 2019, before the 2019 election. The same company, YouGov, did a couple of these MRP polls, and the last one they did was remarkably close to the real result. So people will be taking this very seriously. Does that have any consequences? Oh, it most certainly will. The big get-out clause, I suppose, the Conservative Party, is that they can say that any poll is a snapshot of public opinion rather than a, proje a projection or a prediction. Uh, so people's minds can change. One of the big points that the Conservatives always point to in these polls is the high level of people saying that they don't know how they'll vote. And the hope of the Conservatives is that those don't knows will break for the Conservative Party and YouGov apportions those on previous voting habits, doesn't it? Exactly. So that's why this poll actually is slightly better for the Conservatives than some other polls, that's because right. it assumes some of the stay-at-homes will actually turn out to There vote. was another uh, big poll using this uh, novel MRP technique that was released in the Sunday Times. Now, this was done by a campaigning organisation, a left-wing campaigning organisation called Best for Britain. That had the Conservatives down on 98 seats 
which was uh, really very, very low indeed. We're talking about 155 seats for the Conservatives in this YouGov poll this evening. That's around, that's within 10 of that 1997 result, although it's 10 fewer than that 1997 result. So a worse result than John Major performed against Tony Blair. Although we might be six months out from a general election, so there could still be movement. Uh, and, and things can change. Well, let, let me um, bring in my um, panel. Um, Kai, the Labour Party rubbing their hands with glee and thinking it's all done and dusted and they don't have to say anything interesting. They can just wait for mm. office to fall into their laps. That's certainly not what they should be doing, but I imagine there are quite a few parties happening in, in uh, the Labour areas tonight. I mean, this honestly is devastating for the Conservatives. I really do think so. I think it's a continued confirmation of Rishi Sunak's appalling political instincts. And, of course, you know, this idea that pushing the election out and waiting for a tax-cutting autumn statement or for things to improve within the economy, I think that's farcical, to be honest, because we've seen these kind of get-out clauses before, you know, the budget, perhaps, or stopping the boats. These simply haven't worked. And so I think that is not going to be working. But also this idea that a new prime minister, a new leader might help staunch the bleeding, I think that's also for the birds. So well, well, that allows me to say news. that I'm supporting the prime minister. But, Claire, do you think that is an option for Conservative MPs? Do you think they suddenly spend the Easter recess writing letters to Sir Graham Brady? Or is that utter madness? Well, it's utter madness. Uh, it won't stop some of your colleagues from doing so, and I can see the attraction of that. When you see polls like this, it does send shivers down the spine slightly and people will be worried. However, we've been around this block before. We've had three different prime ministers. Nothing really has changed. I think people are just generally angry, and if we did another vanity membership vote and contest with, with your colleagues, then it isn't going to change. It isn't going to have the desired effect. I think what the country actually wants to see is a party coming through with some ideas that bring hope to people, because that's what we desperately, desperately need. We haven't spoken about housing, the economy needs to pick up, those kind of things to get people on side. But Labour's being very careful not to talk about that. Those things mm. says not to rock the boat. So we have a party has been in office for a long time, mm. and when you say new things when you've been in office for 40 years, 14 years, people say, "Well, why didn't you do that before?" Yeah. Mm. And a party of opposition that doesn't dare say anything mm. because it thinks that there's more risk in offending people than there is in winning supporters by its dynamism. So this makes for a politics that nobody's really happy with. But I think the problem is that the opposition can afford to sit there and say nothing. At the moment, they just let the Conservative Party deal with it. And I actually think these poll results is a bit of a double-edged sword for Labour because it can lead to a slightly laissez-faire attitude if they consistently see that they're ahead in the polls. And um, they'll start to take their foot off the gas, they'll start to make mistakes, which is where the Conservative Party need to be regrouping, rethinking and coming up with a coherent plan. And is there any hope in the poll for the Conservatives? Any sign that there might be life yet in the old dog? It's an old dog that's lasted a few hundred years. Monday marked the 32nd anniversary of something known as the Sheffield Rally. Now, this was the oh, moment, yeah. days before the 1992 general election, when Neil Kinnock took to a stage in Sheffield uh, with adorned with flags and glitz glamour celebrities even endorsing the Labour Party. At this point, he was double digits ahead in the polls over John Major. And it was almost seen as a victory party before the victory. What happened after that uh, moment of hubris from the Labour Party? Uh, a concentration of minds amongst the electorate and a decision that actually perhaps it's not worth the risk from the electorate. Now, big questions as to whether we're actually at that point or whether people are so fed up with the Conservatives in government that they'll go for Labour. But sometimes there are risks in complacency. Things can go wrong. I remember that evening I was out canvassing, as you might expect, just for an election, and a lady told me there'd been a rally with 20 million people. Turned out it was 20,000. <laughs> Some things you learn. Anyway, thank you for talking to my panel. Coming up next, HMRC continues to insist on working, or at any rate, idling from home, despite millions of telephone calls going unanswered. But I might just know the lady to help them get back to work. Plus, could the Royal Mail itself be issuing counterfeit stamps?
Hello again and welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, there will be some further heavy rain first thing across southern areas, but in general, Thursday offers some much drier weather compared to the wet weather we've seen recently. Northeastern areas have suffered the most with the rain throughout today. That rain will clear away through tonight, but the next batch arrives into the southwest. We'll see two bursts of rain. This one will turn heavy at first in the southwest, but as it pushes into parts of northern England, it will turn a little bit dry, but most areas will see some heavy outbreaks of rain through the night. Further north and west though it should stay dry and we could see a touch of frostbite tomorrow morning but it's in the southwest tomorrow morning where the heaviest rain will be and that will push into parts of Wales, the Midlands, into the southeast throughout the rush hour. So if you are moving about on Thursday morning expect some tricky travelling conditions. Once that does clear out the way we'll see a mix of sunshine and showers for many areas of England and Wales. There will be some decent sunny spells in between that will feel fairly pleasant in that sunshine but further north it's going to considerably drier day than it has been lately. We'll see highs of around 10 or 11 degrees across northwestern areas. It's still cold though in the far north of Scotland and as the next batch of rain bumps into that cold air on Friday morning there's a risk of some snow across the highlands and Grampians and we'll see outbreaks of quite heavy rain push through many northern areas throughout Friday. Further south though it turns drier as the day goes on but the weekend is looking unsettled and seasonably windy but exceptionally mild. That's all for now. Bye-bye. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. While the male mogs have been zooming in in response to the YouGov poll, Steph says, I've been doing YouGov and opinion polls for years. Just recently, I've not answered any questions regarding the election. They know I'm a Conservative voter, just coincidence. And a certain gentleman called Daniel has sent in a message saying, Jacob, will you be losing your seat in the next election? To which the answer is, I hope not. But it was a Labour seat up until 2010, and I've always assumed it's marginal that any MP who thinks he's got a safe seat has another thing coming. And Colin, it's not too late for the Tories if Sunak took action tomorrow. Yes, I rather agree with that. We need some oomph. It's happened before, and then you can win elections with oomph. Um, the former head of Ofsted, Amanda Spielman, has declared that Britain is becoming a dangerous place where it is impossible to have difficult conversations. This comes after an inquest into the suicide of primary school headmistress Ruth Perry, found that Ofsted had contributed to her death after relegating her school from outstanding to inadequate over safeguarding concerns. Spellman, who was chief of the education regulator at the time, has defended Ofsted by saying that there is often too much focus on being kind to adults working in public service rather than concern for those using it, which in this case is schoolchildren. I'm actually rather a fan of Spillman, as during her six-year stint as His Majesty's and previously Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Education, she was in favour of high standards and led the public sector in getting civil servants back into the office. Which brings me on to the fact that half of HMRC's Whitehall desks are still empty. And I phrase it in this very pedantic way, because not everybody has their own desk. So if half the desks are empty, many fewer than half the people are going in. And this is in spite of customer complaints. Data published by The Telegraph shows that in average week during the first quarter of this year, only 53% of HMRC's desks for civil servants were in use. 
Maybe it's time for Jim Hara to start having difficult conversations with his staff. Well, my panel is here to talk about this, former Home Office Special Advisor Claire Pearsall and the political commentator Kai Wilshaw. Um, Kai, she has a point, doesn't she, that it's all very well being nice to people, but actually public services need to perform. And if they're underperforming, you have to say to some people, you're not doing well enough. I think it's quite grand to hear somebody from off, uh, formerly from Ofsted say this. I think that's misdiagnosing the problem that Ofsted has, really, uh, in terms of why aren't school inspections working. But, you know, yes, I do think that we need a reassessment of working from home. It doesn't work for everybody. I personally would hate having to work from home all the time. I'm pretty useless. But for some people, personal circumstances mean that it makes sense where they live and so on. But when it's a public service, the, it changes the calculus, right? So some public services, depending on the kind of work, then the deal is different. You, you, it can make sense. And it's not a matter of just being nice to people. It can be much more serious or it makes sense. It makes sense sometimes for some people. But yes, the public expects something from their taxes. And in the case of HMRC, frankly, the job they're doing at the minute is simply not good enough. Yeah. And they need to be, be at and, work. And my they? experience as a member of parliament of HMRC on behalf of my constituents was when I started, it was one of the best public services to deal with. It gave the best, fullest answers to constituents. And so it's gone from being really pretty good to letting everybody down. And this seems to coincide with working from home. And I know coincidence is not causality, mm. but it seems quite likely. I'm, not, you know, I'm sure there's something else going on. When, when an institution goes from doing well to failing, then it's, it's a complicated picture, isn't it? I don't think we should have a sort of a, too much of a, a reaction stopping people from working from home at all. But yes, something needs to be done. Something really has gone quite wrong. I'm lucky I'm Welsh. I go to the Welsh number and we get straight through. But uh, that's not the case well, for everybody. Well, something's working with the word distressing. involved. Well, <laughs> but, but Claire, um, uh, uh, Ms Billman has a really good point, that if you're to get excellence, you sometimes actually have to fire people who aren't performing properly. And if we're all lovey-dovey the whole time, we will never get excellence from the public sector. That's a valid point. However, it is also not answering what Ofsted are there to do and how badly they've performed over the past decade at least. Ofsted, when it was first set up to look into uh, schools and the quality of education, would have an inspection across an entire week. They would be in a school, they would look at absolutely everything, they would work with the teachers and get a much bigger picture. These days, it's done in maybe a day, a day and a half, that isn't enough to adequately look at the level of teaching, look at the quality of the education, to look at any problems they may have. So it's all very well to say we need to have some difficult mm -hmm. conversations because, yeah, absolutely, you do. But going in for a day over, with teachers who are incredibly stressed and the level of work that they put in for Ofsted inspections is enormous. I'm a trustee of a secondary school and I'm also a governor of a primary school and I have seen both sides of this. The amount of work these teachers put in is astronomical and the abuse that they get is incredible. So abuse from Ofsted or from yeah, pretty parents much. or who are they getting? They get a lot of, um, not abuse from Ofsted inspectors, that would be wrong. They get um, disdainful information given to them, their people aren't interested and they're quite often not experts in the areas that they're going into. And you would assume, if you were going to inspect a school, that you would have a sound background in education or management and leadership at the very, very least, to go in and have a look at these things. And they're not. And parents are now having to work from information on the internet, which Ofsted have put out a one-word grouping of a school, whether it be outstanding or good or inadequate. Well, what does that actually mean in practice? What is the day-to-day -day teaching like? But isn't a single word very helpful for parents to give them a headline understanding and then they can read in more detail to see what it is good or outstanding at? Sometimes, and uh, I had to look at this when my, my own child went into the primary school sector some years ago now, and it was considered to be an outstanding school. And that was fantastic, and you thought, well, yeah, this is great. And then when you looked down and you, you understood a little bit more why it was outstanding, but you could also see where the failings were. And I don't think necessarily that's highlighted enough. I don't think that people are willing 
to read into what is kind of a very long report. OK, and you've got 10 seconds on working from home, because we've got to... Do you, are you in favour? Are you an advocate? Or do you think we should get people back to the office? No, I'm an advocate of working from home if it works with your employer and if you are doing the job. In the case of HMRC, they're not. They need to be back. They need to get back to work. Well, thank you very much to my panel. Coming up next, we'll be discussing the extraordinary state of Royal Mail after GB News's revelations of counterfeit stamps with the latest twist in the tale coming up after these messages from our generous sponsors. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11pm, I expose the rogues gallery of paedophiles and rapists Britain can't or won't deport. Are they living in a town near you? The Marxist pro-Palestine race-baiting head of the teachers' union is about to lead teachers out on strike again, punishing vulnerable children. Muslim gangs have won the prison turf war. Are our jails becoming jihadi training grounds? And I interview a global Olympic hero who says she'd go to prison with J.K. Rowling as the world laughs at Hamza Yusuf's hate crime laws. That's 9 till 11 p.m. tonight on GB News. Be there. Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. The real danger to our democracy, of course, always was China. And we learn overnight, we'd heard in August last year that the Electoral Commission's website had been compromised, their database had been compromised. And we learn overnight that, yes, actually, the Chinese Communist Party now have access to 40 million voters in this country and their data. Well, to respond to this in the House of Commons earlier, we heard from the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group for involvement in malicious cyber activity targeting officials, government entities and parliamentarians around the world. Well, I don't know how tough that sounds to you in terms of a response, but one member of Parliament, Sir Ian Duncan Smith, was, shall we say, less than impressed. And whilst I welcome these two sanctions uh, from the government, it is a little bit, this statement, like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. The reality is that in those three years, uh, the Chinese have trashed the Sino-British agreement, they have been committing murder and slave labour and genocide in Xinjiang, we have had churches broken and in Hong Kong false uh, uh, court cases against Jimmy Lai. Great quote, elephant giving birth to a mouse, I rather like that. Sir Ian's here, I'll ask him about where that came from in a moment. But it's all going to be OK. It's all going to be absolutely fine. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Well, every evening I say Mel Moggs is a crucial part of the programme and you have been living up to expectations this evening. Adam says, while civil servants working from home are shirking, civil service productivity is shrinking. So tongue twisters are being sent in this evening. John says, why can't HMRC do what my company does? They will not employ anybody who lives more than 30 miles away because you will find a lot of these people moved out of London and now are refusing to come back. And most probably get the London premium should bring in a policy Crossed by all, if you live more than 30 miles away, 
cannot work in the offices in London or anywhere else in the country. And Al is preempting our next discussion. He says the claim of first class post is counterfeit itself. The service is often abysmal. The Royal Mail has been exposed in a GB News investigation which found the Postal Service had been ordering members of the public who were collecting that post or having it delivered to them to pay £5 fines for counterfeit stamps. Members of the public claimed to have bought these stamps from post offices all around the country. But in a plot twist, the post office has told GB News that they secure stamps directly from Royal Mail secure printers. The organisation brought in new barcode scanning system in July and counterfeit stamps have since been highlighted as a countrywide problem. So still with me is my panel, former Home Office Special Advisor Claire Pearsall and the political commentator Kai Wilshaw. Claire, um, we all like the idea of getting letters. There's something quite nice about posting them too. But when you put a stamp on, you don't want the person getting your letter to get a £5 fine. What is going wrong? I think it's, it's an interesting one. And I think because you can purchase stamps from other places, so not the post office themselves, but you can purchase them online. Now, that's always going to be a bit of an outlet for, for people in in the world of counterfeiting because it's an easy sell. So I think we all need to be a little bit aware of what we, where we purchase things and why we do it. And there's obviously some money to be made, but I do think that Royal Mail needs to have a, a long, hard look at the service that they offer, the amount that we now have to pay. And it's of no surprise, the pieces of mail that I had come through this week, one of them had a stamp, the rest were franked mail. So companies don't use stamps. So you do sort of look at it, it's like the customers are the ones that are going to suffer with this and a £5 fine for somebody to pick up a piece of mail that has unwittingly had a stamp that's counterfeit, I think is immoral. Well, I'm afraid I never pay the surcharges. Yeah. If somebody sends me a letter without a stamp on it, I assume it's from a political opponent and they want to cost <laughs> me a lot of money, so I'm afraid I let yeah. it go back to, to the centre. But your advice to people buying stamps would be buy them from a post office, Absolutely. don't get them online, and if they are less than face value, it's bound to be a swindle. Absolutely. Nobody offers you, Kai, this seems fair advice. Absolutely. It makes total sense. But some of these people say they're buying them from post offices. So the Royal Mail must look into this, because if that's true, there must be some problem either with the printing or uh, with the distribution system. Absolutely. Somebody here is taking advantage, but the fault shouldn't be passed on to the customer, of course. This £5 fine is ridiculous. But but the company has such myriad problems at the minute. You look at how many letters are being posted even, the, the sort of postal volume has fallen by around 5% each year, accelerating then last year to 9.5% That's the yearly decline. And though we're getting parcels, we're getting fewer and fewer letters, and that's going to be a generational shift. So they're, they're managing decline at the minute in certain ways. And Royal Mail is going through this process, isn't it, of becoming a parcel delivering company mm. rather than a post delivering company. And that is a difficult transli transition. Absolutely. They have a really difficult job because they have so many operations scattered around the country and these generational seismic shifts are changing fundamentally how they need to operate. Young people aren't sending or receiving letters anymore. They need to take that into account. And the post office has huge obligations. It's got the universal service obligation. Yeah. Um, as I drive around Somerset, I see huge numbers of post boxes all over yes. the countryside, each one of which has to be emptied once a day. There's yeah. a lot to do with a huge decline in numbers. It, it's not an easy business. No, it's not, but I don't think that they've looked far enough into the future. Their future planning hasn't been strategic enough. Uh, and, and Kai's right, there has been uh, fewer pieces of mail being posted. We're all relying more on parcels. And I think the Royal Mail took the decision to prioritise parcels over letters, which, yes, makes sense on the one hand, but not on the other. If you've got people in the constituency that you uh, look after and also in my own area who are reliant upon hospital appointments well, coming by yeah, letter, indeed. they're weeks late often. But, yeah, well, that's sometimes the NHS's fault. That's yeah. another matter. Uh, a Royal Mail spokesman said Royal Mail takes the illegal production of counterfeit stamps seriously. Since the introduction of barcaded stamps, we have been able to significantly split our Infinitives, no, to significantly reduce stamp fraud through added security features. Every barcode is unique, which allows us to identify whether a stamp is genuine or not and whether they have been previously used. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't allude to an 
upcoming crisis for our friends in Japan. By upcoming, I mean in about 507 years' time, so a mere blink of an eye. New analysis has revealed that everyone in Japan will have the same surname by 2531, owing to the fact that the country still follows a law from the early 19th century that forces married couples to share the same last name. The name in question ends up being Sato, meaning helper or assistant. Imagine for a moment a Britain in which everyone had the last name of Smith. That appears to be what Japan is facing. However, the great irony of this new analysis is that on current trends, Japan's population will be minuscule by 2531. The Japanese population is expected to be half what it is now by the end of the century, owing to declining birth rates. So, in other words, there won't be any Japanese people left. So, the real problem for Japan is not about surname policies, but about the birth rate. And this must have been an April Fool that we've got a day late. But never mind. Thank you very much, my panel. That's all from me. Up next, it's the great Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what is on your bill of fare this evening? Yes, thank you very much, Jacob. Great show. Uh, the Marxist union leader who looks like he's going to drag the kids out of school yet again. The monsters that Britain is unable to deport. Uh, Muslim prison gangs, they've won, apparently. They now control our prisons. Uh, should we stop arming Israel? And it's the fight back against the hate crime laws. I am joined by a top Olympian who says that she would happily share a cell with J.K. Rowling. Well, we've got too much prison overcrowding for such distinguished people to go to jail, but I hope you'll carry on fighting the good fight with all your might. That's all coming up for the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I am Jacob Rees-Mogg. This has been State of the Nation, and we're going to the weather, which in Somerset will be glorious. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again and welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, there will be some further heavy rain first thing across southern areas, but in general, Thursday offers some much drier weather compared to the wet weather we've seen recently. Northeastern areas have suffered the most with the rain throughout today. That rain will clear away through tonight, but the next batch arrives into the southwest. We'll see two bursts of rain. This one will turn heavy at first in the southwest, but as it pushes into parts of northern England, it will turn a little bit dry, but most areas will see some heavy outbreaks of rain through the night. Further north and west, though, it should stay dry and we could see a touch of frostbite tomorrow morning. But it's in the southwest tomorrow morning where the heaviest rain will be and that will push into parts of Wales, the Midlands, into the southeast throughout the rush hour. So if you are moving about on Thursday morning, expect some tricky travelling conditions. Once that does clear out the way, we'll see a mix of sunshine and showers for many areas of England and Wales. There will be some decent sunny spells in between that will feel fairly pleasant in that sunshine. But further north, it's going to considerably drier day than it has been lately. We'll see highs of around 10 or 11 degrees across northwestern areas. It's still cold though in the far north of Scotland and as the next batch of rain bumps into that cold air on Friday morning there's a risk of some snow across the highlands and Grampians and we'll see outbreaks of quite heavy rain push through many northern areas throughout Friday. Further south though it turns drier as the day goes on but the weekend is looking unsettled and seasonably windy but exceptionally